Section three of History of the United States, Part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part two, Section two. Renewed resistance in America. The Massachusetts Circular, seventeen sixty eight. Massachusetts, under the leadership of Samuel Adams, resolved to resist the policy of renewed intervention in America. At his suggestion, the Assembly adopted a circular letter addressed to the assemblies of the other colonies, informing them of the state of affairs in Massachusetts, and roundly condemning the whole British program. The circular letter declared that Parliament had no right to lay taxes on Americans without their consent, and that the colonists could not, from the nature of the case, be represented in Parliament. It went on shrewdly to submit to consideration the question as to whether any people could be called free, who were subjected to governors and judges appointed by the Crown, and paid out of funds raised independently. It invited the other colonies, in the most temperate tones, to take thought about the common predicament in which they were all placed. THE DISSOLUTION OF ASSEMBLIES the governor of Massachusetts, hearing of the circular letter, ordered the assembly to rescind its appeal. On meeting refusal, he promptly resolved it. The Maryland, Georgia, and South Carolina assemblies endorsed the circular letter, and were also dissolved at once. The Virginia House of Burgesses, thoroughly aroused, passed resolutions on May 16, 1769, declaring that the sole right of imposing taxes in Virginia was vested in its legislature, asserting anew the right of petition to the Crown, condemning the transportation of persons accused of crimes or trial beyond the seas, and beseeching the King for a redress of the general grievances. The immediate dissolution of the Virginia Assembly, in its turn, was the answer of the royal governor. THE BOSTON MASSACRE American opposition to the British authorities kept steadily rising as assemblies were dissolved. The houses of citizens searched, and troops distributed in increasing numbers among the centers of discontent. Merchants again agreed not to import British goods. The sons of liberty renewed their agitation, and women set about the patronage of home products still more loyally. On the night of March 5, 1770, a crowd on the streets of Boston began to jostle and tease some British regulars stationed in the town. Things went from bad to worse until some boys and young fellows began to throw snowballs and stones. Then the exasperated soldiers fired into the crowd, killing five and wounding half a dozen more. The day after the massacre, a mass meeting was held in the town, and Samuel Adams was sent to demand the withdrawal of the soldiers. The governor hesitated and tried to compromise. Finding Adams relentless, the governor yielded and ordered the regulars away. The Boston massacre stirred the country from New Hampshire to Georgia. Popular passions ran high. The guilty soldiers were charged with murder. Their defense was undertaken, in spite of the wrath of the populace, by John Adams and Josiah Quincy, who as lawyers thought even the worst offenders entitled to their full rights in law. In his speech to the jury, however, Adams warned the British government against its course, saying that from the nature of things soldiers quartered in a populous town will always occasion two mobs where they will prevent one. Two of the soldiers were convicted and lightly punished. Resistance in the South The year following the Boston Massacre, some citizens of North Carolina, goaded by the conduct of the royal governor, openly resisted his authority. Many were killed as a result, and seven who were taken prisoners were hanged as traitors. A little later royal troops and local militia met in a pitched battle near Alamance River, called the Lexington of the South. THE GASPY AFFAIR AND THE VIRGINIA RESOLUTIONS OF 1773 On sea, as well as on land, friction between the royal officers and the colonists broke out into overt acts. While patrolling Nagaranset Bay, looking for smugglers one day in 1772, the armed ship Gaspy ran ashore and was caught fast. 
During the night several men from Providence boarded the vessel, and after seizing the crew set it on fire. A royal commission, sent to Rhode Island to discover the offenders and bring them to account, failed because it could not find a single informer. The very appointment of such a commission aroused the patriots of Virginia to action, and in March 1773 the House of Burgesses passed a resolution creating a standing committee of correspondence to develop cooperation among the colonies in resistance to British measures. THE BOSTON TEA PARTY Although the British government, finding the Towsend Revenue Act a failure, repealed in 1770 all the duties except that on tea, it in no way relaxed its resolve to enforce the other commercial regulations it had imposed on the colonies. Moreover, Parliament decided to relieve the British East India Company of the financial difficulties into which it had fallen, partly by reason of the Tea Act, and the colonial boycott that followed. In 1773 it agreed to return to the company the regular import duties, levied in England, on all tea transshipped to America. A small impost of threepence, to be collected in America, was left as a reminder of the principle laid down in the Declaratory Act, that Parliament had the right to tax the colonists. This arrangement with the East India Company was obnoxious to the colonists for several reasons. It was an act of favoritism, for one thing, in the interest of a great monopoly. For another thing, it promised to dump on the American market, suddenly, an immense amount of cheap tea, and so cause heavy losses to American merchants, who had large stocks on hand. It threatened with ruin the business of all those who were engaged in clandestine trade with the Dutch. It carried with it an irritating tax of threepence on imports. In Charleston, Annapolis, New York, and Boston, captains of ships who brought tea under this act were roughly handled. One night in December 1773, a band of Boston citizens, disguised as Indians, boarded the hated tea ships and dumped the cargo into the harbor. This was serious business, for it was open, flagrant, determined violation of the law. As such, the British government viewed it. Retaliation by the British Government Reception of the News of the Tea Riot The news of the tea riot in Boston confirmed King George in his conviction that there should be no soft policy in dealing with his American subjects. The die is cast, he stated with evident satisfaction. The colonies must either triumph or submit. If we take the resolute part, they will undoubtedly be very meek. Lord George Germain characterized the Tea Party as the proceedings of a tumultuous and riotous rabble who ought, if they had the least prudence, to follow their mercantile employments and not trouble themselves with politics and government, which they do not understand. This expressed in concise form exactly the sentiments of Lord North, who had then for three years been the King's chief minister. Even Pitt, Lord Chatham, was prepared to support the government in upholding its authority. THE FIVE INTOLERABLE ACTS Parliament, beginning on March 31, 1774, passed five stringent measures, known in American history as the Five Intolerable Acts. They were aimed at curing the unrest in America. The first of them was a bill absolutely shutting the port of Boston to commerce with the outside world. The second, following closely, revoked the Massachusetts Charter of 1691, and provided furthermore that the councillors should be appointed by the king, that all judges should be named by the royal governor, and that town meetings, except to elect certain officers, could not be held without the governor's consent. A third measure, after denouncing the utter subversion of all lawful government in the provinces, authorized royal agents to transfer to Great Britain or to other colonies the trials of officers, or other persons, accused of murder in connection with the enforcement of the law. The fourth act legalized the quartering of troops in Massachusetts towns. The fifth of the measures was the Quebec Act, which granted religious toleration to the Catholics in Canada, extended the boundaries of Quebec southward to the Ohio River, and established, in this western region, government by a viceroy. The intolerable acts went through Parliament with extraordinary celerity. 
There was an opposition, alert and informed, but it was ineffective. Burke spoke eloquently against the Boston Port Bill, condemning it roundly for punishing the innocent with the guilty, and showing how likely it was to bring grave consequences in its train. He was heard with respect, and his pleas were rejected. The bill passed both houses without a division, the entry unanimous being made upon their journals, although it did not accurately represent the state of opinion. The law destroying the Charter of Massachusetts passed the Commons by a vote of three to one, and the third intolerable act by a vote of four to one. The triumph of the ministry was complete. What passed in Boston, exclaimed the great jurist Lord Mansfield, is the overt act of high treason proceeding from our over-lenity and want of foresight. The Crown and Parliament were united in resorting to punitive measures. In the colonies the laws were received with consternation. To the American Protestants the Quebec Act was the most offensive. That project they viewed not as an act of grace or mercy, but as a direct attempt to enlist French Canadians on the side of Great Britain. The British government did not grant religious toleration to Catholics either at home or in Ireland, and the Americans could see no good motive in granting it in North America. The act was also offensive because Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia had, under their charters, large claims to the territory thus annexed to Quebec. To enforce these intolerable acts, the military arm of the British government was brought into play. The commander-in-chief of the armed forces in America, General Gage, was appointed governor of Massachusetts. Reinforcements were brought to the colonies, for now King George was to give the rebels, as he called them, a taste of strong medicine. The majesty of his law was to be vindicated by force. FROM REFORM TO REVOLUTION IN AMERICA THE DOCTRINE OF NATURAL RIGHTS The dissolution of assemblies, the destruction of charters, and the use of troops produced in the colonies a new phase in the struggle. In the early days of the contest with the British ministry, the Americans spoke of their rights as Englishmen, and condemned the acts of Parliament as unlawful, as violating the principles of the English Constitution under which they all lived. When they saw that such arguments had no effect on Parliament, they turned for support to their natural rights. The latter doctrine, in the form in which it was employed by the colonists, was as English as the constitutional argument. John Locke had used it with good effect in defense of the English Revolution in the seventeenth century. American leaders, familiar with the writings of Locke, also took up his thesis in the hour of their distress. They openly declared that their rights did not rest, after all, upon the English Constitution or a charter from the Crown. Old Magna Carta was not the beginning of all things, retorted Otis, when the constitutional argument failed. A time may come when Parliament shall declare every American charter void, but the natural, inherent, and inseparable rights of the colonists as men and as citizens would remain, and whatever became of charters can never be abolished until the general conflagration. Of the same opinion was the young and impetuous Alexander Hamilton. The sacred rights of mankind, he exclaimed, are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written, as with a sunbeam, in the whole volume of human destiny, by the hand of divinity itself, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. Firm as the American leaders were, in the statement and defense of their rights, there is every reason for believing that in the beginning they hoped to confine the conflict to the realm of opinion. They constantly avowed that they were loyal to the king when protesting in the strongest language against his policies. Even Otis, regarded by the Loyalists as a firebrand, was in fact attempting to avert revolution by winning concessions from England. I argue this cause with the greater pleasure, he solemnly urged in his speech against the writs of assistance, as it is in favor of British liberty, and as it is in opposition to a kind of power, the exercise of which in former periods cost one king of England his head, and another his throne." Burke offers the doctrine of conciliation. The flooding tide of American sentiment was correctly measured by one Englishman at least, Edmund Burke, who quickly saw that attempts to restrain the rise of American democracy were efforts to reverse the processes of nature. 
he saw how fixed and rooted in the nature of things was the American spirit, how inevitable, how irresistible. He warned his countrymen that there were three ways of handling the delicate situation, and only three. One was to remove the cause of friction by changing the spirit of the colonists, an utter impossibility because that spirit was grounded in the essential circumstances of American life. The second was to prosecute American leaders as criminals. Of this he begged his countrymen to beware, lest the colonists declare that a government against which a claim of liberty is tantamount to high treason is a government to which submission is equivalent to slavery. The third and right way to meet the problem, Burke concluded, was to accept the American spirit, repeal the obnoxious measures, and receive the colonies into equal partnership. Events produced the great decision. The right way indicated by Burke was equally impossible to George the Third and the majority in Parliament. To their narrow minds, American opinion was contemptible and American resistance unlawful, riotous, and treasonable. The correct way, in their view, was to dispatch more troops to crush the rebels, and that very act took the contest from the realm of opinion. As John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. Opinions were unseen, but marching soldiers were visible to the veriest street urchin. Now, said Governor Morris, the sheep, simple as they are, cannot be gulled as heretofore. It was too late to talk about the excellence of the British Constitution. If any one is bewildered by the controversies of modern historians as to why the crisis came at last, he can clarify his understanding by reading again Edmund Burke's stately oration on conciliation with America. References G. L. Beer, British Colonial Policy, 1754-1763 to E. Channing, History of the United States, Volume 3 R. Frotheringham, Rise of the Republic G. E. Howard, Preliminaries of the Revolution, American Nation Series J. K. Hosmer, Samuel Adams. J. T. Morse, Benjamin Franklin. M. C. Tyler, Patrick Henry. J. A. Woodburn, Editor, The American Revolution, Selections from the English Work by Leakey. End of Section 3